Episode 6 of Dungeon Meshi was surprisingly good. You know, not that I thought it was going to be bad or anything, but for one that focuses on two small-scale individual stories, there was some really impressive animation. This was a really interesting one, so let's break it down. This episode was produced in collaboration with a smaller studio called Anishia, particularly in the second half, and you can really tell that the extra resources meant they could give full attention to both halves of the episode. This floor is mostly ghosts and zombies, so there's very little to eat besides the treasure bugs from the last episode, and the crew is getting hungry. Marcel protests when Chilchuk points out her stomach growling, and this freakout is mostly made up of two frames alternating, with one extra third one thrown in here and there to make it feel more volatile. It's a lot like that cut of Lyo struggling with his sword from the last time, in the way that the frames repeat at an increasing speed, and it feels like this is starting to become part of the established style of this show. I like this detail when Senshi says that they've only been eating snacks, and Lyo looks up at the thought bubble and drools. It seems like a consistent fact now that Lyos can see all of Senshi's supposedly non-diegetic imagery, like this thought bubble or the little presentations that he does. They really were made for each other. Marcel's staff is super rubbery in this episode. Look how it bends as she swings it here to explode this living painting and stop Lyos from being sucked in. And at the end of the swing, she overshoots a bit, and the head of the staff deforms before snapping back into shape. It makes this motion feel more fluid and acts much like a smear frame with the shape of the staff following the arc of Marcel's arms better than if it had stayed completely straight. It's also bent a little bit in this one frame back here, so I think the animators are not only exaggerating Marcel's movements, but also deliberately giving the feeling that the staff is literally a bit bendy. Which makes sense, given the fact that it's not carved, it's actually made out of living wood. Plus, it just accentuates Marcel's general floppiness. This is such a funny interpretation of this one little side gag from the manga, and I love the way they treat it like, initially this is just an illustration of Lyos's thoughts, and he's physically still in the room with the other characters, but then he turns around and goes into the imaginary world, much like he intends to go into the painting. This is mostly animated on threes, which is a pretty low number of frames for something with as much rapid movement as this, but there's tons of squash and stretch and exaggerated smears, particularly in the highlights of the gray so it makes it feel like this is filmed in a low frame rate and low shutter speed, and the frames sort of blend together in this dreamlike way despite there being relatively few of them. There's some important history going on in the background here, and Lyos is not paying attention. The slight blur in the highlights makes this scene feel bathed in sunlight, but it also gives a sense of separation and contrast between the importance of this scene and the triviality of this one. This keyframe is drawn by episode director and storyboard artist Keita Nagahara, and this this little note here specifies that this piece is a finger and not part of the blanket. This sequence follows the manga panels exactly, including this one frame where Lyos' eyes look like they're gonna pop right out of his head. Though I do wish this was on screen for more than a single frame of video. Who is this little elf? Nagahara adds this wide angle shot to signify this moment of overwhelming emotion for Lyos. Man, the first half of this episode really is the Keita Nagahara show. Check out how the action is led by the head and the shoulders follow a little bit behind and settle into place afterwards. And also maybe check out the like button down below. I will burn your flesh to ash! He's an angry elf. It really can't be overstated how much of this first half can be attributed to Nagahara and co-animation director Hirotoshi Arai. But the real star of the show here is Chilchuk vs. The Mimic. The second half is led by co-animation director Toya Oshima in his first ever TV animation director role. And you'll really be able to see his influence in the incredible background animation in this sequence. We'll get there in just a little bit. This is a simple shot, but one that stood out to me for the way the light projected from the left side of the frame defines the 3D shape of his body. And look at how pointy and bony that elbow is, god damn! It's also just really cool how you can infer the motion of his legs just from his upper torso and the foley sounds of his feet. Past Chilchuk, during what looks like an evil burglar phase, gets freaky cat eyes and a wide angle shot of his own, and this cut uses wobbly lines to show the extreme nervous energy when he realizes he's about to be immolated. I also appreciate this because it makes it way easier to trace with my chronic wobbly hand. It also looks like he's made of jelly now, with 
with this extremely exaggerated overlapping action in his ears. They follow two frames behind as his head drops down in anticipation before jumping quickly upward. I also like the two different sized pupils here. Chilchuck gets trapped in this room with a mimic and he has to find his way out. One more neat little detail before this scene kicks the animation quality into high gear, I liked these two tentative steps forward as he examines the room. This close up of Chilchuck's eye when he notices that the mimic is actually inside the cabinet he's been sitting on is the catalyst that signifies that this sequence is about to go do some real girl boss shit. The blur effect around the edges and slight chromatic aberration gives the impression that we've switched to a macro lens to get this close to his face. I know I reference real world camera stuff a lot, and it's not necessarily because I think the animators are actually consciously making choices to mimic certain lenses and camera techniques per se, but because the language of animation is inherently built upon and linked to the language of live action filmmaking. The fact is that it's hard to make a lens that can focus this close to something, so they often end up showing imperfections like the little fringes of color around the lines in this shot, and the closer you get to an object, the shallower the depth of field, so the more stuff will be out of focus. So it's sort of programmed into our heads at this point that if you make a shot look like this, it'll make you feel like you're physically super close to Chilchuck's eyes, as opposed to just zoomed in on it really close. This whole sequence is all about dynamic camera motion, and it really knocked my dang boots off, is something that I might say if I was looking for an excuse to reuse a bit of animation from an older video that didn't get very many views. This cut sets the stage for the sequence, and you know it's going to be good when the walls start being animated as part of the frames rather than as separate static images. This is my favorite frame from this cut right here. The lines get all smudgy in the places where they're moving the fastest, and Chilchuck's Tims, there's a little name pun for you, because Timberland Boots, Chilchuck's last name is Tims, eh? Ah, uh, but it's only really one boot, and I don't think they've even mentioned his last name. God damn it, John, get it together. Cut that and Chilchuck's boot loses its detail as it snaps into motion. And notice how it's led by the ankle and the rest of his foot snaps downward to show how sudden the movement is. These four cuts are animated by Takeshi Mayanami, and after looking at some of his other work, his style is very recognizable here. His work is generally recognizable by its snappy timing and quick camera movements, often featuring big build-up, one or two super exaggerated frames of motion where the lines get all thick and smeary, followed by an equally long ease on the tail end of the action where it almost feels like things go into slow motion for a second, all of which are present both here and here. But this cut has to be my favorite in this episode, and possibly in the show so far. Well, episode 3 had a lot of competition, I'm not sure. Anyway, this is by Kaito Tomioka, a name I remember looking up because of his huge volume of incredible work on Chainsaw Man and Jujutsu Kaisen, and who is quickly becoming one of my favorite animators. I hope Trigger is treating him a bit better than Mappa does. It's the little details like the way the box wobbles back back and forth with the quick scuttling motion, and how the lighting on the mimic becomes more distinct as it moves out of the shadow in the corner and into the light that makes this shot so striking. And the exaggerated wide angle here stretches out Chilchuck's body so that his flailing arms fill the frame beautifully. I love the choice to place the camera at this diagonal angle so his left hand comes down right in front of it with each step, and the way he's reaching out so far that he's not really supporting his upper body, and his head almost hits the ground with each swing of his arms. It's also a neat trick to combine this fully animated floor, which gets progressively blurred out as the camera movement speeds up, with the traditional background for the walls. I mean, this is just insane the way these floor tiles are animated in full detail to show the camera drifting forward slightly before reversing direction and blurring out. And it all continues after the camera angle changes with some very liberal usage of smears, an incredibly cartoonish squash and stretch when he smashes into the wall on the other side of the room. And this cut is just just as, if not more technically impressive, with the floor and wall all being animated right down to these highlights on the floor tiles that give them depth, and even the shadows of the Mimic's legs scrambling across them. The Mimic moves in full speed, animated on ones, while Chilchuck moves in slow motion in the background, animated on threes, which makes it feel like the monster is moving so much faster that they're practically in different worlds, and really heightens the tension to the point of snapping in the final moments of this action scene. And all that tension is finally released with this simple cut where the camera slowly zooms out and the spikes slowly retract, opening up space in the frame for Chilchuck and the viewer to breathe. Zen Master Senshi boils the thing and adds some salt, I like the way he wiggles his fingers here to get the last bit of salt off, and waits a bit. 
We love a patient king. A little bit of 3D action when Lyo scoops out the meat with one of Chilchuck's lockpicks, which was noticeable but fit pretty well. This was another really great episode, and it felt like it struck a nice balance between the hardcore trigger action and Ryoko Kui's more subtle style. We're slowly but surely starting to see more of the creepy tone underneath the comedy show its face in this episode as more of the dungeon's history begins to reveal itself. And there was a real theme of depth with numerous dramatic wide-angle shots and scenes that are composed of two separate planes in the foreground and background. I'm honestly surprised they went so hard with this one considering that it was made up of two small-scale stories focused on one character each, and especially considering the big aquatic action set pieces that are coming next episode. Subscribe if you want to catch my breakdown of the next episode, and I'll see you next time.